everyone. My name is Sarah Omar, and I'm an assistant professor in Arabic and Islamic studies here at Georgetown University. I'd like to welcome you all to our new series where you get to meet scholars and hear them discuss their intellectual journeys. My guest today is Dr. Umid Safi, professor at Duke University. You can find his full biography on this page. Dr. Safi, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So we, I, I'd like to start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what brought you to your areas of, of research and study. Uh, it, would just, it would be a nice opportunity just to hear a little bit about you and get to know you a little better. Sure, sure. So, you know, I think um, when you start to tell your own biography, to you, of course, it's the only life you've ever lived and it's entirely transparent and normal. And then sometimes when you start sharing it, other people go, oh, that's really interesting and remarkable. So um, I'm kind of an, um, uh, a curious person in some ways that I was born in the US and then my family did the thing that most immigrants never do, which is immediately upon being born, we left to go back to Iran. And so I grew up in Iran from the age of one until the age of about 15. And then we um, re-migrated back to the U.S. as already a U.S. citizen, but somebody who didn't speak a word of English, really, um, until the age of 15. And, um, or spoke maybe like a few words, but certainly not enough to have a conversation. And um, like most Muslim immigrants, I was genetically hardwired to be pre-med. Um, and I, I um, studied math and sciences. I applied to um, my universities solely on the basis of their strength in uh, their medical schools, not even pre-med, like looking ahead to medical schools. Um, and then in my undergraduate years, as I would take the courses in anatomy and physiology and organic chemistry and all that kind of stuff, being a very dutiful immigrant son and, and taking the MCATs and applying to med school and actually getting in, alhamdulillah, um, I continued to take courses in Islamic studies, um, occasionally in, in Persian, in Arabic, I think one course that touched on uh, Urdu as well, and some courses in comparative religion. And that continued to be my hobby. It was what fed my soul. It was after I was done writing my labs, um, I would return to studying works on Islamic thought. And um, I had always had a deep interest in Sufi poetry since growing up. I am Persian after all. Um, and uh, so reading the works of Hafez and Rumi and Saadi and being enchanted by it, um, certainly seeing the, the power of this discourse of love, but not really having a very clear sense of how it fit, if it fit, into an Islamic framework. Um, so, you know, I started reading whatever I could get my hands on. And at that time, it was people like Seyto Hussein Nasr um, and a lot of the traditionalist school, um, Bill Chittick, James Morris, but also Anne-Marie Schimmel and, um, uh, and what have you. But I've also had an interest in liberationist thought, having lived through the Iranian revolution. So I was also reading Malcolm X and Fanon and Ali Shariati. Um, and so if you looked at my bookshelf when I was 18, 19 years old, there was the shelf of works on Sufism, and then there was the shelf of works of liberation. Um, and occasionally I would have a friend of mine who would come and have a look at it and go like, you know, these two don't fit. But for me, there was no contradiction per se, because if you love the folk, you cannot stand to be silent when you see them suffering. It just, it made sense to me that the discourse of love and the discourse of justice had to somehow mingle. Um, and, you know, I remember it was at the end of my junior year that I had the sort of eureka moment of what if I actually go and do for a living the thing that I've been so passionate about? What if um, reading works on Islam and Sufism and poetry is not my hobby, but actually what I pursue? And this is a little hard, I think, sometimes for 
um, younger scholars and students and people who are thinking of going into the field to realize this. When I looked at the people who were the professors of Islamic studies, virtually none of them looked like us. Uh, even if they were Muslim, they were white Muslims. Um, brown people simply um, didn't go into careers in the academy, and if they did, it was few and far between. So it was very much a leap of faith, and I decided to, to pursue that. Um, and I'm happy if you want to talk about where that's kind of taken me and some of the projects and what have you. No, I mean, thank you so much for, for taking us through that initial journey. I think it's really fascinating. And it's one that I think uh, many Muslims might themselves uh, connect with. Um, so, you know, it would be interesting for us, I think, to hear about the types of questions you've been asking throughout your career. And I know you've had a really uh, long and, and productive career. And so the types of questions you've asked and how those questions maybe have shifted or evolved over time as your uh, thinking has also developed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my, my first interest when I went into uh, graduate school was um, works of Sufism. And in particular, people like Rumi figured, um, you know, they, they figured very prominently in it. Um, and, you know, sometimes you learn from your mentors. And we're so blessed to have had people like Bruce Lawrence and Carl Ernst and Vincent Cornell and others. Um, and then sometimes you also learn with your peers. I think that's one of the experiences that sometimes you don't know. But uh, you know, I was fortunate to have had people like um, Zia Inayat Khan and Kisha Ali and Simi Ghazi and Scott Kugel and Talat Halman and others uh, as part of a core group. And um, my dear friend, uh, he's also a wonderful Sufi teacher, uh, Zia Inayat Khan, said, well, you know, if you really love Rumi, you should see about this path of love that he has inherited. And there are thinkers hundred years before him. So he introduced me to this um, Persian Sufi named Ainul Qudat, who was killed at the ripe old age of 33. And already by that time, he had written so many fantastic works. Uh, I think if he had lived to be about 70 or 80 years old, today we would be talking about him really as someone on par with a Rumi or an Ibn Arabi. Um, so really my my query started with this question of who would kill a loving mystic like this? Why was he killed? And uh, much to my delight, I discovered that these extraordinary love mystics were not sitting in some cave meditating. They were fully active social agents that the very same people who are talking about how the love of God and the love of humanity connect together are the same ones who are walking into the court of the sultans and the caliphs and calling them out. Um, this is far from a model of political quietism that sometimes people assume to be um, normative uh, Sunni Islam. These are all Sunni Muslims, Sufi Sunni Muslims, but with a fire in their belly for justice. And uh, so that project kind of grew uh, into what became my dissertation and then my first book, uh, Politics of Knowledge in Pre-Modern Islam, which certainly included my beloved Ainul Ghazat, but also people like Imam Ghazali, um, Nizam al-Mulk, and the whole intertwined nature of religion, politics, and Sufism. Um, I finished the dissertation, got my first job, and 9-11 happened at the same time. Uh, and just as, you know, the people that I was studying, they couldn't be silent. I felt like we didn't have the luxury of being silent either. Um, so one of the changes that I saw was, you know, we were being called upon to speak and to explain and to help our students and our communities and the media make sense out of the chaos around us. Um, so we were pushed into public scholarship, and that ended up becoming um, the second book, the Anthology of Progressive Muslims, um, a term which, you know, sometimes I think people use and abuse in all kinds of ways. 
essentially all that we meant by it was that you have to be grounded and rooted in the tradition to approach it critically and you have to simultaneously adopt this multiple critique of addressing and confronting the injustices in your own tradition and in your own community and the injustices of the neoliberal empire uh, of rampant capitalism and uh, so far from kind of just trying to prove that you're a you know good a muslim who's just wrapping yourself in the flag um, you had to have a, a double consciousness, a multiple consciousness. Um, and um, that, that part of public scholarship has continued. Nowadays, there's a whole lot of brouhaha that I'm just too old uh, to kind of respond to. And frankly, I don't think it's worthy of my breath. Um, and it's one of the joys of actually being in this middle age of life is that just because somebody writes a book blasting you, you don't feel necessarily the need that you have to get up and defend yourself. It's like, okay, let them have their say. I'll just do my life. Well, well, I guess one other question that I was uh, curious to have you address is how your approaches and methods uh, and maybe even theories that you rely on uh, in addressing some of the questions that you've asked, how have those changed over time? Or um, especially as, as different fields that you're working within have also changed and shifted. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think coming out of grad school, I went to grad school in the early 90s. It was the heyday of postmodernism, poststructuralism. So now when I read sometimes some of my earlier works, you know, Foucault and Said and Derrida and all these people are looming very large on, on the stage. And at some point, I think I came to say, like, where is it said that, uh, not Said, I love me some Said, but like, where is it said that the theoretical insights of these white European, Euro-American men has to be the lens through which we look at the lived reality and experience of our people and our tradition. Why can't we take the insights of a Rumi or an Ibn Arabi as our insights? Particularly at a time where less than probably 10% of all the great Muslim texts have been critically edited or translated, much less analyzed. So I think to the extent that you know, I'm operating by a kind of method these days. It's to always view Islam in a polycentric global context and in an adamantly multilingual context. Um, there's no denying the um, place of prominence that Arabic has. And I want to add to that the works that have been done in Persian, in Urdu, in Turkish, in Wolof, in Bahasa, and whatever else to the grand picture that we're synthesizing. Um, and I think sometimes, because we as scholars are also interested in questions of authority, and sometimes our own authority, I notice a way in which people are constructing a model of Islam in which there is this normative voice of fiqh, the legal tradition, possibly with a dosage of kalam as theology, and people are approaching it as the normative Islam, and then somewhere out on the fringes are the cuckoos of the philosophers and the poets and the Sufis. And I want to I wanna push back against that because as a historian, I know that um, the works of these poets and these mystics are absolutely in the center. They belong in the center. They belong in the heart. Um, so, you know, when I wrote the book on the prophet, yes, I wanted to um, consult the works of Sira, uh, of the biography of the prophet and hadith genres, but I also wanted to have works of devotion because that's how the majority of the people came to think of the prophet, not through Ibn Ishaq, but through Qawali songs and devotional songs in which the prophet is above all else, Rahmatun lil alami. So I think there's also something historic about that. Um, and then, you know, the kind of projects have led me to works like Radical Love. Um, it's this um, anthology of translations, mostly from Arabic and Persian. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think the last, I know we're short on time, um, the last thing that I would say is that uh, approaching this phase of my life, one of the questions that I keep asking myself is, who are we writing for? So often, I think our works are so theory 
and jargon laden that we're trying to impress those six other people uh, who at the end of the day may not even need our works because they can read the original stuff just as well. Um, and it's not a matter of, are we writing for the academy or are we writing for students? Or are we writing for the public? And if so, which public? It's a question that we have multiple publics that we're writing for. Um, and I think that's a part of my own commitment in this age is to continue uh, to keep these different publics in front of me. Wow. Thank you, uh, Dr. Safi. Such a pleasure to have you and, and, and really hear you uh, discuss your intellectual journey and, and, and uh, the evolution of your thought and work and the questions that you're asking. Uh, this, is, this is really such a delight. So thank you so much for, for, for being here. Alhamdulillah. I'm so grateful to you for the work that you're doing. And I think you're doing an extraordinary service by letting people see that there's always people, complicated, messed up, beautiful people, uh, who are part and parcel of this grand conversation that we're all a part of. So I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care.